Last week I talked about hell and um, that is a hard subject to talk about. When we talked about heaven and hell and final destinations and the reality that Jesus talked about hell in the New Testament about 23 times, um, such an important thing to discuss, but man, it's intense. And boy, we had conversations this week with so many. And um, one of the interesting things that occurred to me is that Jesus, when he was meeting people during his three-year ministry of his life here on earth, never walked up to somebody and said, follow me so you don't go to hell. Not one time. Um, I don't remember, maybe it's there and I'm, I'm misremembering, but I don't remember him ever walking up to somebody saying, turn or burn. Um, if you don't follow me, you're going to fry. I mean, whatever it would be, he just never started that way. He always called people to something. He always called people because of something. He saw something in them and loved them. And of course, heaven and hell are real. And of course, after we die, our choices are over. We no longer have the ability to choose to receive Christ and spend eternity with him. But there's so much more than just an eternity in heaven to be had with salvation. I asked the question, which was kind of a thinker for some of our staff. We had good discussions about this. If there was no heaven and there was no hell, and by the way, I believe there is. The Bible teaches very clearly in the afterlife and final destinations and eternal punishment or eternal blessing. But let's just suppose for a second that there's not. Would you still follow Jesus in this lifetime if there were no consequences in the real life to come? Well, I hope the answer is yes, because if the answer is no, then um, re usually that sort of brings about kind of a, a, a half-hearted rule following, how good do I have to be to make sure I don't go to the bad place, but never really understanding what salvation is all about and never truly experiencing the blessing that comes from living life and relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about that today. Jesus in Matthew 13 has two little mini parables. They're micro parables. They're some of the smallest parables you could ever find, stories he told that didn't really happen, but stories Jesus really told. And he talked about how amazing the benefits of the kingdom of God. If I were to ask you, why is it you are a Christian? You would have an answer. If somebody else were to come to you and ask you, why is it that you're a follower of Christ? What would your answer be? We're gonna talk about that this morning. And in a few minutes, you're gonna hear from a couple of our pastoral staff about what it is about Jesus and their relationship with Christ that they appreciate so much. Let's look together at Matthew chapter 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice, pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great price, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. Now, you may not really track with the idea of a field and the idea of pearls and everyone who heard this back in Jesus' day would have known exactly what he was talking about, but I want to try to explain it to you. Um, the first little parable, this analogy, this explanation of the kingdom is like a uh, man who was treasure hunting. Have you ever seen these goofballs walking around on the beach, um, treasure hunting, looking for something in the, there's, speaking of goofballs, Pastor Dan, what do you, what do you have in your, in your hand? Ashley's lost her diamond ring. Ashley lost her, oh, Ashley lost a diamond ring. <laughs> if you find it, keepers. if you find it, put it in the offering box. All right. Oh, yeah. Man. Let's do that. Okay. You know, my grandfather actually was a treasure hunter on the beaches of South Florida. I grew up in South Florida. My grandfather, he looks a lot like you, only he was five foot six. Um, he had black knee socks and sandals and wore a Speedo to the beach, but he walked around and uh, thank you for not wearing a Speedo, by the way, Pastor Dan. He walked around hunting for treasure and he would come back to the house and he would give us all kinds of things that I wouldn't really consider treasure. Uh, he would give us broken sunglasses and, you know, watch bands and things that he had found discarded in the sand. And I loved my grandpa and loved talking through his treasures, but never actually really found anything that I would have sold anything to purchase. The Bible talks about a man who was in a field and he was maybe walking through, maybe working in the field and found a treasure buried in the field. 
The treasure was so valuable that he sold everything he had in his excitement and purchased the field. And some may say, well, he shouldn't have done that. That's dishonest. And I would say it's not dishonest at all. First of all, he was honest enough to purchase the field. The one who owned the field clearly didn't know there was a treasure. There was treasure in the field because the banking systems were so small and corrupt in Jesus' day that no one would put their money in a bank and they would bury things like furniture and clothing and and treasure. And if a person didn't know it was there, it means he had purchased the land or acquired it long after somebody had, had buried it. And so instead of stealing it, or taking the treasure and selling it and then using the money to come back and purchase the land, he actually did the right thing, which was to go and sell what he had and buy the field. In the Old Testament law, there's even a provision for people who happen along in a field and they find treasure or find something that finders, keepers, losers, weepers. You could keep it if you found it, as long as it didn't directly belong to the person who had buried it there. So there wasn't an ethical dilemma with this at all. Um, But the point is that when this treasure hunter who wasn't even a treasure hunter until he found treasure. Isn't that the way we all are? Didn't know we were looking until we found it. Was so excited that he sold everything he had and purchased the field. What's that mean? When you sell everything you have, what do you have left over? Nothing. Okay. When you sell everything you have, I'm going to check this section over here. What do you have left? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. That was pretty good. I'm going to go over here. When you sell everything you have, then you have nothing, right? Nothing left over. Now, is that scary? Only if what you've purchased isn't worth it. Next, there was a merchant of pearls. And you say, what's the big deal about a pearl merchant? Well, pearls were like the diamonds of um, the Middle East back in Jesus' day. They were so valuable that um, people fought over them. People killed for them. Cleopatra was said to have owned two pearls worth several million dollars back in that day. And um, sometimes emperors would grind up pearls in vinegar and put them in their wine and drink them to show how, how rich they were. Now, pearls did not just happen along when you were plowing a field. Pearls came from the ocean and it came from, does anybody know where pearls come from? Oysters. Pastor Dan said clams. And I said, I don't think so. I think it's oysters, but maybe they come from both, right? And so you have to find them at the bottom of the ocean. And this is the way they had to get pearls. They would go out into the Mediterranean Sea or another sea and low man on the totem pole in this little wooden boat would have a rope tied around his waist and there'd be a rock on the other end of the rope and they would row out where they think the pearls are and throw the rock over. Then you would go over with the rock and you would go down, 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 hopefully not too far where you're crushed by the depths. Um, And then you'd have to walk around, feeling around for the oysters. If you can find the oysters, free yourself from the rope and surface, you could survive. But if you couldn't, so sad, too bad for you. Now, I Googled monsters of the Mediterranean because I wanted to find out if it was dangerous like the oceans are here. I used to surf in the Pacific Ocean and often in the red triangle there, um, north of San Francisco, they would set these warnings off uh, when I was in the water uh, because there was a great white uh, shark spotted and we'd have to usually go in and then wait for the great white to swim somewhere else. I wanted to know if there were any dangers. There are some terrible things in the Mediterranean. There's this thing in the Mediterranean that was much more common in Jesus' day Then today, it was called a devil ray. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? A devil ray is a stingray that's 15 feet wide. And they get down into the sand and they bury into the sand and they lift that tail up out of the sand. And can you imagine being the guy that gets chucked out of the boat? And here you are, it's your turn, down, 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 down. And you're wandering around. You land on a 15 foot devil ray, slaps you and oh my goodness. It was dangerous, people died. People killed for pearls. It was like the most valuable diamond that you could ever imagine. You search for it, you find it, you sell everything to get it. Now, this section, when you sell everything you have, what do you have left? Nothing. Very good. You guys got the point now. Nothing. Is it okay to have nothing left over? Yes, as long as what you have acquired is worth it. 
Now, there are a few things, observations that I want to point out here that I think are important. First, it was valuable, this gospel. This gospel is the treasure. The gospel is the pearl. The fact that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life, being fully God and fully man, taking on our sin, dying on the cross, paying the price for our sin so that we don't have to pay this price, rising again, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all. It was valuable, and it was so valuable, it caused these two people to take everything they have and have how much left over our last section nothing except what they had acquired which was everything it was also hidden not immediately evident when found it stopped the searching the searching heart is a god-given characteristic or trait installed in each human at the time we're born. And it is designed to continue to keep us restless enough to search for truth until the Holy Spirit reveals that truth to us and we choose to become followers of Christ. But once you find this truth, what do you do? You stop searching in Northern California. When I moved there to plant a church, searching for truth was a cultural value. People would sit around coffee shops and restaurants talking about searching for the truth and how you never really wanted to find anything. You never wanted to arrive at a conclusion because that was narrow-minded, but it was all about the search. So I had a bumper sticker that I had printed and I put it on the back of my car and it said, I've stopped searching. And people yelled at me, how can you be so close-minded? What, have you given up on life? And I'm like, no, I haven't given up on anything. I found what I'm looking for. So when you find what you're looking for and you give everything to get it and you have, I won't ask you again, nothing left over that you used to have, isn't it worth it if it's everything that you imagined that it would be? So what does a person do? We stop searching. Well, it's found in different ways. And I find this to be interesting. One man happened along a treasure in a field that he didn't know was there. That was like the apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, Paul wrote most of the New Testament under the, or a lot of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't always a Christian. He was a persecutor of Christians named Saul and God changed his name. And on his way to kill Christians, God surprised him by literally blinding him, knocking him off his horse. And he heard the voice of Jesus say, why are you persecuting me? And so he didn't really know he was looking for Jesus, but Jesus found him in a very surprising way. And then you have the pearl merchant who was out searching for this truth restless, wanting the treasure, finally finding it and selling everything to get it. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, also in this beginning part of Acts, Acts 8 and Acts 9, these two stories. Think more about the Ethiopian, less about the eunuch for this story, but he was searching scripture, restless in spirit, knowing something was hidden but had yet to find it came across Peter and he said, explain to me this gospel. Here's water, can I be baptized? And Peter explained the gospel and he became a Christian, a believer, a follower of Christ. So it's found in different ways. And some of you here today, maybe your hearts have been restless. Maybe you just instinctively and intuitively know that there's something that you're missing not sure what it is. It's still hidden, but you're plowing the fields. You're searching the pearl markets, maybe intentionally or maybe by accident. Watch it online. Maybe you have no idea why this hit your feed and no idea why you stopped because you don't normally stop and listen to a preacher. But perhaps it's God who is unfolding 
who's revealing to you this treasure, this pearl that's worth you giving everything for because it's better than you could ever imagine. Well, there are different reasons why each of us follow Christ. I shared with you seven years ago, almost seven years when we started our relationship together, that I had two words that kind of described to me the pearl and the treasure. You could have your own words, I hope you do. If someone were to say to you, why is it I should follow Christ? I don't want you to lead in any way other than the way Jesus led by simply saying, well, if you don't, you're gonna to go to hell. Is it true? Absolutely, it's true. But aren't there so many more compelling and genuine ways to start a conversation with somebody than that? How about the ways that Jesus did? For me, my relationship with Jesus gives me hope. If you ask me why is it that I should be a Christian, I'm gonna tell you because without Christ, I have no hope, period. I have examined life. I've thought about it carefully. I've met, as have you, thousands and thousands of people along the way. And Jesus and Jesus alone gives me hope. And that comes through the gospel. And friends, that is worth me giving everything I have for. My second word is meaning. The thing that scares me more than anything else is living this life and getting to the end, looking back filled with regret, realizing my life was meaningless. Meaning only comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where you find the reason you were created. You live the role that God created for you. And of course, when we die, there's an eternal and final destination. And hell is unimaginable in its horror. And heaven is equally as unimaginable in its, in its beauty and its pleasure. And it's real and it's true, but there's so many reasons to accept Christ now and to live, to live for him each day. Now, after we sing, a couple of our staff team members Pastor Brandon and Jared are gonna come and share with you a couple of reasons why they can call this gospel this treasure of immeasurable value or this priceless pearl. Why they have given everything of themselves to receive this and the difference it makes in their life. When I go to Northern Arkansas to visit my son, Richard, he lives about a quarter mile from the a city park and um, you know, this city park has a senior center in it. Lots of uh, retired people live in Mountain Home. It's one of the top five places in the US to live. If you are retired and you like outdoor activities, um, they have lakes and rivers and things, but they also have a walking trail at the park that's right next to the senior center. The walking trail is about 1.1 miles around. It's got a few little undulations. I don't know that I'd call them hills, but um, when I go to visit Richard, I go and walk uh, on that trail usually every day. And when I walk, um, I, I walk for exercise. I don't run. The Bible says that only the wicked flee when no one pursues them. <laughs> Um, so I walk because it's spiritual, it's biblical, but I put a weight vest on, I take my dog and we go and we walk. And um, when we walk, I time myself and I know exactly how fast I wanna walk. And I have my, my mile splits that come up and I know whether Daisy and I need to pick up the pace or whether we can slow down a little bit. Um, I get a little bit so obsessive over it that uh, when Daisy stops to do her number two, I'll pause my Apple watch and you know, kind of keep things going there. Uh, and then hurry up, Daisy, come on. And then I'll start my timer again. When I get done, I go to my wife and go, Joy, I beat my time by six seconds. And she sort of rolls her eyes and smiles and says, that's nice, doesn't really care. That's just what I do. Usually I have a sermon on. I don't like talking to people. That's my point when I'm exercising. Now, it's full of old people, older than me, so I can call them old. I'm getting old now, by the way. I'm almost, a, I'm not even gonna say it. 53 is almost, a, you know. Uh, I could go to the senior center. 
And um, I know some of you are older. It's not that bad. I get it. But, you know, there are two types of people that walk on the trail there, two types of retired people. There's one and you see them. And they, they all want to talk, by the way. They don't have enough to do, I don't think. They want to talk. They want to, hey, you know, I want to talk. Meet your dog, whatever. I, She'll bite you. She doesn't bite. She judges. I've told you that before. Um, my dog will judge you. Now, they say uh, they want to stop and talk. And, and so, why are you walking? Whatever. It's very easy to tell the ones that are there because their doctors made them go. There's some and they'll tell you, the only reason I'm here is my doctor said I'm going to die if I don't walk. They usually have a fat dog that they're dragging behind them. And the dog's like, I didn't, you know, the doctor didn't tell me I had to walk too. And, and, and you look at them, they're usually in dress pants and they got the wrong shoes on and they're just hating life. They're grouchy. They just are doing it because they don't want to die. And their doctor made them. It's like a prescription. You go walk. And then you have your other type of person who's like 90 years old and they come flying through in spandex, right? And they're walking and they want to talk to you and they're like, isn't this the best lifestyle ever? I've been walking since I was 30. I'm so healthy and it's going to help us live so long. And they're a little bit annoying, but yet if you have to choose which of the two you want to be like when you get to be that age, I want to be the 90 year old minus the spandex flying through, enjoying life. It's what I've done for years. Isn't it fun? It's the only way to live. Well, Christianity is similar in some ways. Some people are doing it with a scowl on their face and they're begrudging everything and everyone. And you say, why do you do it? Because I don't want to die, right? I don't want to die. I hate this, but I don't want to die. And so they sit in church and their arms are folded and they're scowled at you. No, if your arms are folded, it's fine. I'm not judging you, (laughs) but they're scowling. and, And it's like, what's the deal? Isn't there so much more? But then you see some who get it. And they're flying through this life with meaning and purpose, heading toward eternal life. Now, I told you Jesus didn't start conversations with people saying, turn or burn, you're going to hell. But he did call them to eternal life. But the secret is that eternal life didn't begin or doesn't begin after death. It begins now the moment you pray to receive Christ or whenever you begin walking with him. You begin to live an eternal life. And the benefits of the eternal life begin to become evident here in this life. And that's what was so obvious with Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 13 that the treasure and the pearl brought great happiness. He said about the man who found the treasure, in his excitement, he sold everything he had and he bought this pearl. Excitement also can mean contentment. It also can mean joy. And he was so overwhelmingly grateful that he had found what it was, that he had been missing all of his life, that it was an easy thing for him to do, to sell everything he had and have what left over? Nothing from his old life, but it was okay because his new life was so worth it. I've asked Pastor Brandon and Pastor Jared to come and share with you some things in their life that they would call treasures in the field or pearls of immeasurable value related to their relationship with Jesus. Well, I'm at a spot in my life where not many stories uh, are shared that don't have to do with my kids. It's, it's a big, big part of my life. And so I'm sitting there one day watching my kids and they're putting together a, um, a Lego set. It's supposed to be a spaceship kind of a thing. And um, I'm watching this disaster unfold right before my eyes because they start opening each pack one by one all of them, and I can't see instructions laid out anywhere on the table. The pieces start mixing, and I thought to myself, I should get in here and help them on this. So I offered my assistance. Would you like me to help you with this project? And uh, didn't hear much of anything. I asked them, I said, how about let's find the instructions? If we can find those instructions, we should follow those instructions. That will help us. And they were so polite about it. They said, no, thank you, Papa. They said, we don't need your help. We don't need the instructions. We're having fun and we are going to make this spaceship. 
I thought, that's great. I was kind of proud of them. I already saw the train wreck in motion though. So I sat back and I watched and uh, they got done and they have this creation that they brought to me, but not with excitement. In fact, it was with disappointment that they brought it to me because there were still a whole bunch of Legos on the table and what they brought me kind of resembled a spaceship, but there was like the wings weren't lined up and uh, the part that was really the kicker was they had this little pilot guy and, and he couldn't fit in the cockpit because it wasn't made big enough for him. And I got to thinking when Pastor Rick asked me this question of, of what it is, what has been a treasure in your relationship with Christ? And I thought, man, what it's been for me has been his direction, his instruction along the way, because I'm not too old, but I've spent enough years trying to do it my own way, spent enough years uh, just answering my own questions. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do whatever feels good, and then we'll probably do it again. And we're going to do whatever benefits me and everybody else. Good luck. And we're going to make sure we have fun in the process. Those are the things when I'm in control, when I'm at the wheel where we're going. And what I realized was that there's such a better way when we slow down and when we listen, we begin to have this relationship with God. It was like a light came on. It was like I was given uh, glasses. I've been walking around without glasses and I could see doorways and I could see people and I can see that the grass is green and the sky is blue. And I thought I could see so much, but it was only when I got the glasses on, the right lenses on, I saw how much I was missing. I saw that there was in fact a better way. Now, I'm the kind of guy who uh, I don't really love rules, like at all. Um, it's not my thing. This isn't what I would call a treasure. If you were to say, Brandon, why are you, what, what's your treasure for following Christ? Honestly, rules would have been the last thing. I, I looked at Christianity as, well, it's a whole bunch of rules that you had to follow. Otherwise, you were going to get beat over the head with something, and then you were going to be on your way to hell if you don't follow the rules. And what I learned was, it was like I was given a blueprint. It was like I was given like a cheat code to life as I looked at some of the instruction, some of the guidance, some of the examples that God lays out in his word. It was something that was, how impressive is it? How, how much of a treasure is it to have the blueprint from the person who created you? How much of a treasure was it to have the life hack to someone who wants better for you than you could even want for yourself, than you could even dream up or imagine for yourself. And so I found this joy, I found this treasure after searching and found it in a place where I would have never imagined in a neighbor's field, if you were, or at the bottom of the ocean. I couldn't believe the treasure that I found, but through that treasure, I found another treasure. You see, my boys, when they brought me this spaceship thing, they felt like they had nothing. They felt empty because it wasn't what it looked like on the box. It wasn't how it was supposed to be. And even though they had something that resembled a spaceship and might have flown a little ways, it wasn't anything for them. They wanted what was on the box. They wanted it to work and function the way that it was supposed to work and function. And so I kind of felt that same way. As I follow these directions, as I follow these life hacks, these uh, blueprints, if you will, I found a fullness that was a treasure that I can't even put into words. Because I did like what most of you guys have probably done. I think I'm not alone in here in that like, man, I can find that fullness in my job. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna achieve. I'm going to gain the acceptance of my employers. I'm going to rise to a level of some kind of status. I'm going to end up uh, making a decent wage. And then at the end of the day, I get home I set my alarm and I chalk it up to another lap on the hamster wheel. Coming back to another day with the emptiness that I started the last one on. Okay, maybe it's not work. Maybe, 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 just maybe it's in stuff. If I purchase some things, uh, if I get a vehicle or if I uh, buy some technology, maybe whatever that tech may be, just stuff in general. And once I have those, I know I will be fulfilled. It's gonna help me in my walk with Christ. It's gonna be amazing. And yet they just keep making more stuff. And I keep not making enough money to buy more stuff. And now I've got to move my stuff every time I move houses and... I'm left empty again. So maybe it's not stuff. Maybe it's not work. Maybe it was in my experiences, in my relationships with others, traveling, 
events, whatever it was, I tried, I searched and searched and searched to find this fulfillment that I ended up finding. I found this fulfillment in Christ. I found out that it didn't matter what I was doing. It didn't matter how much I had, how much I was achieving. If I knew that I was walking in step with him, if I knew that I was following that guidance, that direction that he had been giving, I wasn't experiencing a fulfillment that only he could end up giving. It was a treasure that I had been searching. I, I had created an appetite as I reached for this at work and I reached for that in a vehicle or I reached for this. It was this appetite that kept growing that could never be fulfilled until that appetite was Jesus. And that was a treasure that was so incredibly valuable for me that is worth the whole entire relationship that I have with Jesus. Well, uh, Capital City, my story uh, kind of starts out even with, with Brandon's. I was reminded uh, when Rick asked, um, I was reminded of the story of a friend. Uh, it was through watching somebody else that I uh, was the first thing that popped in my head. And I have a good friend who uh, we were talking and they were saying that in the past, their boss has talked to them about why do you go to church? Why do you follow Jesus? Your life isn't any easier following Jesus. So why do you do it? And I was so encouraged by this friend and their response because it was following Jesus doesn't change my circumstances. That's not what I believe that following Jesus is. Following Jesus allows me to endure my circumstances. Everyone in life has hard. Everyone in life has difficulty. Um, and so I was so encouraged thinking about that. And so as Rick and I talked about this, um, endurance and then joy through value were the things that came to my mind. Being able to endure difficulty. Um, I have trusted Christ 30 years ago uh, this last week. And as a little boy trusting Christ, um, I knew I wanted a relationship, a relationship that I didn't have at home. Uh, if you don't know my story, I grew up in a home that where we went to church, uh, we went to church camp, we were around church, we were a Christian home, uh, but my dad was not someone who expressed love, appreciation, or put anything into our lives that showed us that we were of value. Uh, when I was in ninth grade, I failed ninth grade English. And when my dad found out, we were out in the garage and I got punched, uh, hit me hard enough, I fell to the ground and he stood over me and he looked down and he said, I'm ashamed that you're my son. I'm ashamed to be your father. And he set my value. He told me what I was worth. But again, God, gives us, gave me endurance to continue walking through these difficult times. Later on, I was 18, was dating Crystal, uh, felt like I was on a, a good path in life. I'd gotten my first real job and I got my first real paycheck. At this point in my life, my dad had gone from working at a Bible college um, to he started a mortgage bank and he was making a million dollars a year. Uh, he had moved to an 8,000 square foot mansion in West Des Moines and we were at a party and he had some friends over and I went and told him, dad, I did it. I got a job. I've worked. I've got my first paycheck and I wanted to let you know, I wanted, I wanted you to be one of the first people that, that, that heard this. And he chuckled and he said, give him a few weeks. They'll figure out who you are and get rid of you. And he again set my value. I was not worth much. And people would discover that with time. Eventually, everyone would find that out, that Jared wasn't worth anything. The, the best thing, though, about this story is this isn't a story about him. This is a story about God. And through the next several years, uh, marriage, being a dad, uh, aiming at being faithful in church, I still had that nagging 
I was pursuing a ghost. I was pursuing, aiming at proving someone wrong. Uh, over the last 14 years, it's literally been a ghost because eventually his abusive ways landed him in prison. And we've not had a relationship in 14 years. God continued to build my endurance, especially over the last few years. Um, and God used that endurance, but also used a challenge by Pastor Rick to help me to realize that God had set my value. Pastor Rick asked us a couple years ago to be willing and ready to share something that we had seen uh, in Jesus's walk in scripture that had had an impact on our lives. And for me, instantly, it was Jesus' prayer life. He could approach God the Father with intimacy, with transparency, with boldness. He could tell God the Father in the garden twice, twice that evening, he said, if there's a way this cup can pass, right? Jesus knew the plan, but still felt like he was comfortable enough and could go and share and, and express this to God the Father. And I had never experienced that. But through this, again, God used that to encourage me, to remind me that he had set my value. He had set that value so high that he had sent his son to die on the cross in my place, to make a way for us to be reconciled, for us to have that relationship. What men meant for evil, God intended for good. And he made this abundantly clear to me in the last few weeks, especially. I have a 16-year-old daughter. You guys have all seen her twice. She was on the announcement video. She was up here singing this morning. And I love the heck out of my kids. And, um, but she was sitting. We were sitting at dinner, and she was having a hard time. She was going through some tough things in life. And as we sat after dinner talking, just her and Crystal and I, she finally got mad because she, she stood up from the table and she said to us, you need to stop loving me. I'm not worth it. I'm a bad kid. I'm not a good person. I'm not worth loving me. Please stop. And I told her, I said, I, I'm so sorry. I think there's been a misunderstanding. I set your value. I have determined that you're worth loving. I get to say that. You don't get to speak against something that I have set value on. I love you, and kid, that's not changing. God loves you, and that's not changing. God broke those chains in my life. God gave me the opportunity, the ability, the strength to move forward and make sure that that doesn't happen to another generation. And that treasure of being able to love my daughter that way is worth everything the world has to offer. So who wouldn't want to be a follower of Christ? That's, that's what I wonder. I just wonder why in the world if somebody really understands um, how valuable this relationship with Jesus is, how priceless it is, who wouldn't want to walk with Jesus? Meaning, significance, hope, direction, value, forgiveness, peace in this life, and the guarantee of a future in heaven to come forever, for eternity. But there are reasons people choose not to become followers of Jesus. I don't always understand them, but I can appreciate people having different perspectives. The last thing we learn from this, these two parables is that receiving or acquiring this pearl and this treasure involves a transaction. And uh, that freaks out some Christians because you can't buy your way into heaven and that is certainly true. You can't be smart enough to get into heaven, you can't be good enough to get into heaven and you can't be rich enough to get into heaven. But it involves a transaction. Now, I beat this horse to death earlier as you and I had a little fun with each section repeating to me the principle that I want to communicate here. When you give every single thing about yourself to Jesus, what do you have left? Nothing of your old self, but everything of Jesus. So who wouldn't want to be a follower of Christ? When I give everything I know about myself to everything I know about Jesus, 
I become a follower of Jesus Christ. I ask forgiveness for my sins. And the Bible tells us that, that the wages of sin, what we're due because of our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. That if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin and forgive us of all unrighteousness. So we confess our sin. God, I'm sorry I've sinned. I agree with you. I've had actions, thoughts, and attitudes displeasing to you. Forgive me. And he forgives us. I believe who Jesus is. I give everything I know about myself to everything I know about Jesus. And I don't know everything about Jesus. And I have a head start on many of you, at least just through the years of study. Impossible to know everything, but you know enough that Jesus is God. He came to earth as God's son, revealing himself to us so that we can understand God's character and nature and love, lived a perfect life, spent the last three years of his life explaining and living out the kingdom principles that we're talking about. The things that you heard Brandon and Jared talk about, the things many of you could talk about if you had the opportunity that he allowed himself to be put to death because somebody had to pay the price for our sin to reverse the curse placed on humanity. And he took on our sin and died so that we wouldn't have to and rose again. And when he did, he defeated sin, he defeated Satan and he defeated death once and for all. So that anyone who believes in him won't perish in hell, but can have eternal life in heaven that begins now on earth. And you simply tell him, I want to be a follower. I want to follow you. But there is a cost. There is a transaction. I want to read to you a passage from the book of Luke that explains this. Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me so that we're not living life like the person at the park walking laps with the overweight dog and the grouchy face because the doctor made them and they just don't want to die. There's so much more. You give up your old way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your old life, you're going to lose it anyway. But if you're willing to give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And here it is. What do you benefit if you gain all this world, but you lose yourself, that you're lost or destroyed? You have a sickness of the soul. So it involves a transaction, and that's where a lot of people fall short. They want to give some of themselves to Jesus, but hold some back. Most of themselves to Jesus, but keep a little left over from me. They want a golden parachute. They want that, you know, escape clause. They want some fine print in the contract. And Jesus says, that's not the way it works. If you trust me, you'll follow me. And just like the stories we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks, when people leave their old life behind and embrace this new life in Christ, everything changes. You can stop searching. You can be home. Your life will be full of hope and meaning, and you will live with the rhythm of the promise of the reality of heaven to come. So why wouldn't anybody become a believer, a follower of Christ? Well, how do I do that? You might ask. Well, you pray. Well, I can't pray. I can't even read Shakespeare, let alone speak like Shakespeare. Don't you have to have some these and thous and thuses and therefores to unlock God and have him pay attention? Um, man, people make prayer so weird sometimes, right? We go into this liturgy and all these things and prayers are just conversations that you have in your mind toward God or even out loud. When you think a thought toward God, that's a prayer. You can say it out loud or you can keep it private. And he installed in you the ability to communicate with him, even though you may not know it. And when you do, 
He says, hey, there you are. I've been looking for you this whole time. Just a prayer. Confess my sin. I believe who Jesus is. I'm giving you everything I know about me to everything I know about you, God. From this day on, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. And that's it, my friend. You become part of his family, a citizen of the kingdom, from old to new, from darkness to light, from death to new life. And for you, everything changes. Why wouldn't you today want to receive Christ? If you want to talk to Pastor Dan, myself, Lori up here in the front, Brandon, Jared, Ashley, our creative arts director, we would love to talk with you. We'll all be hanging out after church today looking for you. If you're online and you would like to reach out, there's contact information there uh, on the bottom of your screen that will let you know how to get in touch with us. And we would love to help introduce you to Jesus so that you can be welcomed home. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that as we close this time out, that you would do what it is you do. It seems too good to be true. But you're in the too good to be true business, God. It's supernatural. If we were in control or in charge, it'd be natural and we'd mess it up. But you're in charge and you're supernatural. So it's almost too good to be true. For my friends here who may have been considering becoming a follower, perhaps today is the day they decide to take that step. To simply give themselves to you in whatever way they can. Whether a thought, a thoughtful prayer, whether spoken out loud to somebody else or just out loud to you, whether through a conversation with myself or one of our pastors here who helped make the introduction. I pray that if there's anyone here in this room or joining us online who has yet to see how you will take a life, their life, that's significant but incomplete and bring this hope and meaning that's just better than we could ever have imagined. I pray, Father, that they would make the decision now and do it because at the end of our biological lives, our chances, our choices, our ability to choose dies with us. And none of us knows when that day will be. I pray for those of us who've been Christians for a while, followers, and we've lost our passion, our authenticity, our drive. We are begrudgingly walking the trail with a scowl on our face because someone's making us do it. I pray, Father, that you would break our hearts as we rediscover our passion for you and our love for your gospel. We love you. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen.